Yeah, ask that person next to you. Ask them, who cares? <laughs> there, um, I had a real good friend, another pastor friend of mine, pastored in in the, in this uh, in this district, and when we were in we were in Bible college, that he decided he was going to start a ministry. That his ministry, and he even had the title of ministry, and his ministry was Who Cares? Who Cares Ministries? And, and so he was trying to put together the kind of the, the theme or the, the logo or the saying, you know, the, the catchy phrase that's going to, people are going to hear it and going to say, wow, that's, that seems awesome. And so he was thinking something along the lines are, are you hurting? Who cares? And I was saying, that might not work, Greg. That might not be the best way to put that, okay? <laughs> How many of you this morning say, oh, well, I care. But have you ever got to that point in that place where it's just like, I don't know. I don't know if I care anymore. And that's kind of the situation, circumstances I find a lot of people in right now. Because of all the stuff that's going on, all the stuff that people have been going through, thinking, man, I don't know if I really care anymore. But here's one that does care. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him. Casting all your care upon Jesus. Casting all your care, all the weight, all the frustrations, all the anxiety, everything that has overwhelmed you. He said, you need to cast it all on Jesus. And here's the reason why. Because he cares for you. You know, one of the greatest attacks of the enemy is getting you into that place of frustration where you will proclaim and you will say this. You'll see this escaping from your mouth and you'll say, well, I'm over it. No, nobody's saying amen or nothing anymore. No, I'm, I'm just over it. I just really don't care. I'm ever been there. Ever been there? Just the frustration mounts to the plate where I'm just done. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. <laughs> and that's, there, there's another axiom that a lot of people have found themselves. I am sick and tired of being. And, and some people are saying, I just want some change. I don't care what it looks like. It's just something needs to change because it's, it's not good the way this is headed. And I get that. And we find ourselves retreating. We find ourselves moving into a place of self preservation because we are tired of being hurt. We're tired of the fear. We're tired of everything that is taking place around us. We feel helpless in the fact that. The, the ones that have been placed in position of care and of, of leadership, especially in the national offices. And I'm not, I'm not talking about a particular political party because across the board, most of them are the same. As, unless those are, they know Jesus. And I know a lot of great uh, politicians that know Jesus. But the vast majority, we feel, have failed us. And so what we do is that we, we disengage. Now, this is not a political message, so just hang on just for a minute. Because this, it's, it's not going to be about an individual that is placed in leadership in this nation that's going to turn it around. It's not an R or a D after their name that's going to make a difference. You know what's going to happen is revival is what's got to happen. That God has got to show up in our nation and bring salvation across the board and deliverance. And that's how healing comes into our land once again. This nation was forged and formed one nation under. It's still on your money. 
and as we return to that. But, but until then, what happens is we just kind of retreat, don't we, into our world. Us four and no more. The chosen frozen. Because we're over it. But do you know that is one of the greatest weapons of the enemy? Satan will use apathy. Someone say apathy. This apathetic attitude like, I really don't care. I'm really disengaged. What happens is apathy moves into complacency. And complacency is the nail that the enemy will use that drives home, that causes you to be ineffective anymore in this world. When you have disengaged to a point where because you're thinking, well, what's next? What's going to happen next? You know, it's, it's very interesting to me that, that just in a, in a couple of weeks, just a few short days, that there's an anthem, Richmond, North of Richmond, has become the number one song on the top 100 and across the board most downloaded song. And it's about the frustration of the working class. And I get it and I understand that. But what happens is we get, if we allow that frustration and we have this overwhelming attack that comes against us to withdraw and to move into complacency, the church is no longer effective. The church, church is no longer able to connect. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge. How many are ready for a challenge today? Are you ready to be encouraged today? Are you ready to be drawn out of that dark place? To understand that anointing, the gifting that rests upon you, that you are who God called you to be. You know, you didn't get there overnight. You didn't get to that place of complacency overnight. There's a process of pain that takes place. Frustration. You have moved through decades, some of you, through, through even more of the years of aggravation because of the manipulation that has gone over and over and over again. And what happens is those things steal motivation. When you're placed, let me say this again. Look at this. When you're placed in the process of pain and you are overwhelmed by frustration, let's say frustration. I know you know what that means. Come on. And aggravation. Ever get aggravated? Well, pastor, I'm kind of aggravated right now. Manipulation. The enemy will manipulate your mind, your circumstances, your situations, your workplace, people around you, your family, and you get tired of that. And when you allow those things, when that happens to you, and it's not so much you're allowing it, but it just happens to you, what it does is it steals and removes your motivation. And where that leaves you is in a place of anxiety, worry, and fear. I'm anxious about tomorrow. I'm worried about what's going to happen. And I fear that everything is going to be unraveled and destroyed as the nation that we know it. I've heard that. I've heard those things said and reiterated over and over and over and over and over by so many. But I'm going to bring some light into this situation. God was a God of yesterday, not dread. Yes, he is a God of yesterday. But he said, behold, I want to do a new thing. He said, the latter house will outshine the former house. So do you not know that all this that is taking place, not just in this nation, but in the nations across the planet, that God is allowing it for the preparation of, for the sweeping gospel and an open heaven and the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit to sweep the nations and bring revival like we've never known. How else can the latter house outshine the former? There are some really good things that have happened in my lifetime. I mean some phenomenal things that have taken. I've seen some revivals that shook the nations. Argentine revival where millions of people were, were swept into the kingdom. One to Jesus Christ. The revival in Eberly's, also powerful move of God. Welsh revival at the turn of the century. I did not see that, but I read about that. Brownsville, Brownsville revival, things that have happened that just ministered to millions of people. Seen that. And I'm wondering what's coming next, if it's going to be even greater. 
it's going to be really good. I don't want to miss it because I'm under some rock in a dark place waiting for Jesus to come. Now, I'm going to mess with you just a little bit. Is that okay? Even if it's not, I'm still going to do it. Because we get into this dark place of anxiety, worry, and fear. There's a lot of things that bring that on. A lot of things that will bring you into the place of worry. And some of you tonight or this morning you came and said, well, I really wasn't worried about anything until you brought it up. Thank you. Second Timothy chapter one. I want you to see this. If you would, six is the verse. One is the chapter, chapter one. Second Timothy he said, therefore. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Say spirit of fear. I want you to recognize something because that word pneuma is, is not just as in Holy Spirit, not just spirit of God but is also in reference to the demonic spirits. And this is the reference right here, that this spirit of fear is not of God. This spirit of fear that would grip you, that would manipulate you, is from the enemy, from Satan himself. So fear is not of God. So when you're feeling this anxiety, when you're overwhelmed with these things, you've got to recognize this is not God behind this. 90% of winning this battle is recognizing where it's from. Because many times we'll just beat ourselves up. I wish I wouldn't feel like this. I wish I wouldn't have these issues. I wish I wouldn't feel this anxiety. I wish I wouldn't feel this terror. I wish I didn't have all this worry. And we beat ourselves up and say, what's wrong with me? When in reality, the source is not in you. The source is attacking you. And the enemy, listen to me. Watch this. The enemy has found an area in your life that's working. And he can grip you. He can spiritually paralyze you you think he's going to continue to do it if it's working so you can beat yourself up and say i wish i would just change all you want but until you're able to do battle in the arena where god has given you weapons and armor to defeat the enemy in this area you will constantly dealing with fear and anxiety, doubt, discouragement, and depression. These are all forged in the corridors of hell that has waged war against you in your mind and in your family. And what we must do this morning is begin to realize not only the source, but understand the authority that God has placed upon you. Is a spiritual attack. Faith is not unraveled in the body. Faith is unraveled in your mind. Satan can attack. How many have been under a physical attack as of late? You've been this just stuff's happening. It's kind of weird. And I, you know, I'm thinking, well, I'm just getting older. And so stuff happens when you get older. You wake up with, man, I wake up with sore muscles. I didn't even know I had those muscles until all of a sudden now they're sore. I said, man, where did that come from? And somebody said, you know, there's a hitch in your get along. Oh, that's the first time I heard that hitch in your get along. Need to unhitch that get along, I guess. And I'm, I'm going to speak to the, the elderly saints this morning a little bit because the older we get, we recognize that this, this body, this, this house that God has given to us wears out. 
And then now we're paying. <laughs> you know what you did before, years before, during the bulletproof years? Where you're bouncing down the highway or whatever you was doing? And you, now some of you younger people say, yeah, you know, I, I, can, I can do what I'm doing. You know, I might be sore for a day. You're stacking it up, okay? You are, you are building. And one day you're going to have to pay. <laughs> right, Steve? And, uh, there's not, uh, Steve knows what I'm saying. You know, you can only fall off the roof so many times. And I begin to look at that and I'm thinking, you know, it's just because of what I did before. And I'm, you know, I'm, but that's not necessarily the word of God. It's not the promise of God because his will is for you to be healthy and to have strength all the days of your life. And he's the Lord of the harvest. Somebody say, amen, Lord of the harvest. And even though I've sown some things that I should not have sown, he's still Lord of the harvest. And he still is able to take those tears and those weeds and those thorns that have come up and remove them out of my life. Someone say, amen. The healing virtue of my Lord and Savior will give me strength today. Right, Bobby? It gives me strength today. That what I can do is I can do it. The Lord has given me the strength to do what he's asked me to do. And we got to hang on to that. And not listen to the lies of the enemy. Say, well, you're going to be crippled. You're not going to get around. You're not going to be able to do. And what you got to do is say, shut up, devil. I'm tired of listening to the lies. God has purposed me. He has anointed me. He has gifted me. And I will do what he's called me to do. Because that's God. Not me. He made this body. And he can repair it. Nod your head. Yes, or I'll go around this one. It's, that, is, that is so key, and I don't know who that was for, but I want you to hang on to that. The spiritual attack that has come in. You see, if you were serving God, and in his will, none of these problems would ever happen. You ever hear that lie? Because it is. If you were serving God... And you were walking in his will. You're not going to have any problems, they will tell you. Eh, that's not true. That sounds good, and that really preaches for the few people that never have any problems. And I have never met one yet. There are some people that are able to hide it real good. Well, let me show you in the Word of God. He said, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many, come on, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God will deliver you out of them all. In this world, he said, you will have trouble. But I have overcome the world. So there's this guy. He ended up starting... Dozens and dozens of churches. He went into very dark places. I mean, demonic manifestations. Right in the heart of some of the most difficult situations, circumstances, difficult people. People far from God. Never heard about God. He went in, waited right in the middle of those places and he started churches. Thousands of people were saved. Literally thousands of people were saved. And his ministry is still valid today. In fact, God used him to write a bunch of letters that encouraged churches and people across the world. In fact, those letters that he wrote are found in your Bible in the New Testament. And this guy's name was Paul. Paul, 
healed the sick. He raised the dead, cleansed the lepers. He cast out demons. He preached the gospel. Thousands of people were saved. Do you think Paul was in the will of God? Just asking. <laughs> Do you think Paul was serving Jesus? Some of you ain't nodding or nothing. You're just looking at the thousand. I don't know. Yes, he was. <laughs> Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For one that was serving Jesus, one that was being poured out like a drink offering, he gave his life. He gave everything that he had. I mean, everything that he had. He laid down his life for Jesus. He was beheaded for the gospel. Do you know that? This is this man, Paul. And when he has went right in the middle of doing everything that God asked him to do, right in the middle of all that, let me, let me, this is his words. This is what happened to him. Verse 23, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. He said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. He said, in labors, more abundant. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, perils of the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things. And I'm thinking, what are the other things? <laughs> he said, that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So when somebody tells you, if you would just be doing what God asked you to do, if you just would be serving him, if you would just pay attention, then you wouldn't have any problems. I just smile. Nod my head. And say, Lord bless you. Just maybe one day. That you really, really will walk. In the provision. And the anointing. Of Jesus Christ. Because if you're not a threat to hell, there's no reason for hell to attack you. If you are just cruising along and there is no, no provision of the gospel ministering through you, you're not touching lives, you're not encouraging, you're not building, you're not blessing, you're not ministering, then hell will leave you alone because he's got you in the place of complacency. But if you're ministering in the kingdom and lives are being changed, hearts are being drawn, then Satan's coming after you and there will be trouble. But I would hope at the end of my life that I'm able to give the praise and the adoration to say I have run the race, I have kept the faith, I have fought the fight and laid up for me in heaven is a reward because I've done what Jesus asked me to do. Will you have problems? Yes. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. 
It's not but just a season. Yes, there is the night, but there's also the dawn when the sun rises up and dispels the darkness and the glory of God shines upon you and there's deliverance and healing. Some of the most powerful ministries that Paul had was in the middle of a jail cell and he had just been whipped and he'd been beaten up again and he's in the darkness of the pain and everything that's going on and then all of a sudden he began to worship and he began to praise and he began to glorify God. Not because of everything was going good, but because he knew that I got to get to where I know Jesus is. And that's not in the pain, but it's in the praise. And I got to move past this frustration. And I got to get my mind set on the things above. And I begin to worship. And I'm going to worship my way out of this. The heavens begin to open. An earthquake took place and you know. And that Philippian jail is where the church started. Not in the synagogue, not in the streets, not in some church, but in the jail is where the first converts were. And where the gospel came. Macedonia. And still today, still today, a couple thousand years later, there are people, the church is still Worshiping Jesus. Someone say praise the Lord. Now. Fear and anxiety. You can walk this world with fear and anxiety. Fear of all kinds of stuff. Anxiety over situation circumstances. Someone was telling me, Pastor. Pastor. What you need is a five-gallon buck of hand sanitizer and a triple-layer mask. <laughs> I say, you don't understand how this works. What happens to me is only through the permission of the Father. The only thing that's going to happen to Jason McManus... The only thing, the only way Satan can attack me, whether it's trying to throw COVID, whether it's trying any kind of sickness or disease, any kind of pain or brokenness, the only way it comes to me is through the veil. And the only way that happens is permission. You got to read Job to understand how this works. If you don't understand how this works, you've got a blessed, blessed insight about ready to be given to you this morning. Because those that are under that protection, under that umbrella of grace, and through the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan can attack you at will. Do you understand that? The only way that he can come against you is by permission. And that attack is given parameters. He can only attack you what God allows. Nod your head, yes. And with that temptation, with that attack comes a way of escape. You won't be tempted above what you can withstand. That's his word. Read Job. The enemy could not get to Job, and he had to get permission from God, and God gave him parameters. You can do this, but you can't do that. So are you to think that a five-gallon bucket of sanitizer is going to keep me from sickness? you got another thing coming. Satan's going to wade through all that nonsense. It doesn't matter. You can stack up the antibiotics and you can live in a cave all by yourself. But Satan is going to wade through those if he's got permission. I live under protection. Something more than any kind of medication that man has come up with. I live under a protection and an anointing that Satan can't get through. I've been separated unto him. And I walk in anointing. And I walk in that provision because that's what he has given to me. I have not earned it. I have not, I have not willed it. But God has blessed me with those things. Fear will grip you. Thinking that you've got to maintain distance. That you've got to maintain some kind of, some kind of parameters. When God has called us to the sick. I'm going to mess some of you up. On purpose. Here we go. Leprosy was incurable until just this last century. 
leprosy, a communicable disease, by contact, and it was a death sentence. You got leprosy, you're going to die, and you're going to die a slow, painful death. Your appendages are eaten and fall off. Cartilage in your face, nose, and ears. Very hideous, painful disease. Until that enters into your internal organs, and then you die. Those that were lepers, they had to be removed from society. They made their own colonies. And together in pain, they died. That's the only provision that they had. Only ho no hope. When they came within a hundred yards of anyone, they had to yell. They had to scream out, unclean. We are lepers. Unclean. If they did not do that and they came in contact with somebody without saying they were unclean, they would forfeit their life. You know what Jesus did? <laughs> now he is not only the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he is a priest, the priesthood of, under, the, under the order of Melchizedek. He was set apart from birth, taking the Nazarite vow, could not touch the unclean thing. As it come out from among them, do not touch the unclean thing. As a priesthood, he could not. But he did. Because <laughs> here's why. The sickness and disease did not affect him. When he reached out and touched them, and he did, he, when he cleansed the lepers, he touched them. He ministered to them. He put hands on them. And the disciples were way over here. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> and Jesus weighed right in the middle of them. And he lays his hands on them. And he, every one of them be healed. And I would just mess them up. Because they think, man, you could get leprosy and that's a death sentence. You could die. It's not just a holy boldness, but understanding your purpose, what God's called you to do. We can separate ourselves from the darkness of this world or we can wade into it with light. He said, come out from among them, be separate. I get that. And we are separate, but we are separated unto God for a reason and for a purpose to minister love and help and healing. And when I get to this point in this place where I am so fearful of everything that is going on and around me that I'm, I, I shut down and I, in a recluse and I don't connect and I don't minister, then the light also is dimmed and lives are not changed. Are you still with me this morning? Fear and anxiety. Well, we got to understand is what God's will and desire for you. What is God's will? And desires for you. Well, the first thing I want to give to you is in Third John chapter one verse two. Third John chapter one verse two. He said, "Beloved, I like that word. <laughs> I like it a lot. Let me tell you why. Turn to your neighbor and say, you be loved.' <laughs> See that, beloved. I pray that you may prosper." In all things, and be in health, good health, just as your soul prospers. So he wants you to be spiritually strong, to walk in strength, anointings and giftings spiritually. But he also is saying that I pray. My desire is that, that you prosper. 
financially, relationally, that you prosper in all areas of your life and be in good health. Does God want you well? Does God want you to walk in the provision? My God shall supply all my needs. Not only does he give me my needs, but he's a good God. And you know, over and over and time and time, God has given me a number of my wants. Not just my needs. Uh, somebody's got to go, woo <clears throat> Sort of. And I'm not moving down this other prosperity gospel and saying, well, if you do this, then God's going to give you, you know, you'll have a Mercedes or Lamborghini or whatever that is, you know, they do. I, that's not it at all. But what I'm saying is God is going to supply all your needs. What do you need? What do you need? God will supply it. Because he's a good God. That's his desire. His will to bless his kids. He wants to bless you. In Isaiah 41 verse 10. I know I'm giving you some scripture. and We're about ready to wrap it up. Isaiah 41 10. He said, and he said, fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So not only does he want to bless me. But he wants to provide for me and strengthen me, walk with me, and remove doubt and remove fear. That he'll go before me and prepare a way to the left and to the right. He is surrounding me with provision in his great grace. That's his will. That's his desire for you. Even though the enemy comes in and brings the attack, God delivers us out of them all. That's his word. That's his promise. You might be walking through something right now, but I promise you, it's only for a season. It has a shelf life, and it'll come to an end, and then you move into a blessing and a greater provision and a greater relationship with Jesus. Now, his word says sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Look at those situations, those circumstances that you've been waiting through. Understand it is not for any length of time that concerns you. Yeah, I read what happened to Paul. But you've got to read the rest of the story where thousands of people were blessed. Wall, Paul walked in great anointings and great giftings. And ministry was so close to God. God opened up the heavens. He gave him visions and dreams. And spoke with him, walked with him. Gave him joy. Gave him purpose. And that's what God has given to you. I'm going to give you five things this morning to get you into the place where fear and anxiety will no longer be an issue. How many want to hear some stuff that's going to help you with fear and anxiety? Okay, number one, I'm going to press in so I can press on. I've got to be proactive. In other words, I can't wait until I'm so far in need to begin to get to his presence. I need to maintain relationship on a daily basis. Therefore, I'm suited out in the armor of God. If you're wondering what the armor of God is, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor. And I need to understand the weaponry that God has given to me and know how to use the weaponry. And the only way that happens is if I'm pressed in. And that means I'm pressed into his presence. I'm pressed into his word. If I'm pressed into his presence, I'm pressed into his word, then I can press on. I can get through this. That's the only way I'm getting through this. On a daily relationship with my king. Number two, I've got to know the purpose. My purpose is clear. Oftentimes, the situation has a purpose. God allowed it. We talked about that. God allowed it. But there's a reason why. There's a reason why this thing is happening. Do you know that he uses everything? 
That's why Paul said, in everything, give thanks, because it's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so there's a purpose. Sometimes it's as simple as, I need to know him more. And when I'm out there doing my own thing and not paying attention, the Lord will allow some stuff to happen to get my attention, so I will be in his presence. And he uses those things to build faith. Not just cause me to have a greater and closer relationship, but my faith is in a greater capacity to do what he's called me to do. Number three, know that God is with you. Remind yourself, he's with me. I don't have to deal with this by myself. Sometimes stuff happens and we sit there and we agonize over how we're going to fix this. And we'll try 5, 10, 15, 20 different things to fix it. Okay, me, I'll do that. None of you ever done that. You're looking at me like, what are you talking about there, preacher? And then when it all is exhausted, then I say, well, can't be done. All the while, from the very beginning, Christ is saying, I'm in control. Turn to me. Release it to me. Give it to me. And I'll do it. I'll take care of this. He's waiting for me to release it. He's waiting for me to trust him. He's waiting for me to, to give it to him. I've got to remember God is with me. God is for me. And he's not going to let me be overwhelmed. He's walking with me. And I'm him. Number four, we talked about this already. It's praise that breaks the chains. Those chains that are wrapped around your neck that are dragging you down. You want to be free. You want to be free of those chains of fear. Those chains of anxiety. You begin to praise. Begin to worship. Begin to allow the Holy Spirit to move through you. To give him the glory. And what happens is. You interject the power of the Holy Spirit in praise. Here's why worship is so powerful in your life. As you begin to worship God. You worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is why it's so powerful. Is because that's the only place I find in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit inhabits something that I do. Everything else the Holy Spirit gives me the ability to do. But that's the only thing that I do the Holy Spirit gets involved in. Because I'm doing it. It says He inhabits the praise of his people. So the Holy Spirit begins to move through me when I'm praising. And that's the presence of God moving in the problems and the frustrations. When I praise him, I enter into his presence. When I'm in true worship, and Jesus said there's coming a time and now is when there will be true worshipers that worship me in spirit and in truth. And when I'm worshiping, that is that spiritual worship, Holy Spirit worship. I'm moving into his presence. And in his presence, the chains are broken. In his presence, fear is gone. In his presence, healing comes. Deliverance comes. Help comes. And so it's... A, a shifting of my mind and my, my understanding. I've got, to, I've got to get out of my own strength. I've got to get where he is doing what he does as through praise. The last thing is, make that proclamation, fear is not my future. I love that chorus. I love that song. Fear is not my future. But Jesus, you are my future. Would you stand with me? I'm giving you these things, and that encouraged this morning, because I would know, as we've been talking about the call, and God would call you into ministry, 
and I'm talking about, and we're going to do something a little bit different as we close, that I'm going to ask very specifically those of you that feel that God is pressing you in to a full-time type ministry. It might not necessarily be a pastorate or evangelist, per se, as we know those typical those things are typically, but you know that God has placed his hand upon you very specifically, and you know it's it's not just a part-time thing, but a full-time. And you don't know what it looks like yet. You don't know what you, you're not under, sure what it is. And we spent this last month talking about how God has called individuals. But I'm, I'm saying this morning, if you are feeling that God has called you, there's some next steps that I'm going to take you with. Those that you know that God is separating you unto ministry. I want you to just step out from where you're at and meet me at this altar. I've got a book that I'm going to give to you. There's a... Uh, a cohort that you're going to be a part of um, in, a, in the ministry network wide. And I believe that God is going to do some really some specific things in your life. You believe that God is calling you and you're being separated unto him. You don't, you don't know how that really looks like, but you really feel that God is doing that and you're receiving the call. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mike, come here and just help me pass those out. One to a couple there. If there's, a, there's people here. Okay. Church, I want you to stretch your hand towards these. We want to pray for them. Father, I thank you for the call. And I thank you for these that have purposed in their heart. They want to be separated unto you. Lord, that you would give to them some very insightful and very specific things now. Lord, this is not a response to man, but Lord, they, they have had this passion for weeks now and has been pressed upon them. And now they're going to stand in that place to say, yes, Lord, we will do what you've called us to do. We will go where you want us to go. And we surrender. Not just our now, but we surrender our future. And whatever you have, we say, yes, Lord, your will, not mine, but your will be done. Lord, I'm asking that that anointing of the Holy Spirit would just rest upon them in a capacity that cannot be shaken. It cannot be moved by circumstances and situations that this world would press them in. Lord, let them understand and recognize that this call, this high call of God is lasting. And when we surrender to the call, Lord, miracles happen. Heavens open. Lives are changed. Use us, Lord. Whatever your will is, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Those of you that responded, there's a few things that I'm going to talk to you about after the service. If you could just stay for just a little bit. Some of you didn't receive a book. I have some extra books. Um, but there's some very specific things, that the next steps that we're going to take. For the rest of you. There is a call upon all of our lives, and God is using us in great capacities individually. You've been called to minister at work. You've been called to minister in your neighborhoods, in your family, and God is using you mightily, and that anointing rests upon you with great capacity and great power. The enemy would like to unravel that call and like to dismantle it by using fear and anxiety, but we say in Jesus' name, fear is not my future. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And my mind is focused on Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit floods through me. And Lord, your love, that love of God, gives me the ability. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There's a couple of questions. I'm going to pray with you. Very specific prayer. If you would, if you're here and you've been battling with anxiety and fear, just raise your hand real quick. I want to pray for those anxiety and fear just gripped you and you want to be done with it today. Many, many people. Okay. 
I want you to pray this prayer with me. Pray it out loud. Some of you know how to pray. I know, I know that. And some of you pray very powerful, eloquent, anointed prayers. But there might be one here that might not know how to pray or what to pray. That's why I lead you. And it's not the prayer that end everything. It's just the beginning. And you're going to continue to have this conversation with God. It's going to open up an avenue for you to begin to trust him and understand how that provision works. So pray this prayer with me. Will you pray this out loud? Dear Jesus, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you that you've anointed my mind, my soul, and my spirit. I thank you that you have given to me your love, your power, and a sound mind. And I now say in Jesus' name that the spirit of fear, the anxiety, all that enemy would give to me, I say in Jesus' name, get out of my life. You're not welcome. I shut the door and I say to you, in Jesus' name, you will no longer manipulate my mind, my emotions with fear or anxiety. I give myself to Jesus Christ. And I ask you, Lord, to cause my mind to be settled, to be perfected and anointed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Give me the strength. Give me the provision in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you give him praise? Now it's, it's along those lines when you feel the enemy coming at you and there's all kinds of fear and there's anxiety that wells up and you get a thousand questions and things that are said to you that it's not going to work. It's going to unravel. You're not going to make it. Then that's where you take that authority. You just took that authority that God has given to you. That prayer that you just prayed, pray something like that again. You just say in Jesus name, Satan, I will not receive that. I don't believe it. I believe that Jesus is for me and he's with me and I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength and this fear will not grip me anymore. And you tell him, Satan, shut up. That's okay. You can do that. Okay. In Jesus name, in Jesus name, we're going to open these altars. If you need prayer, you want someone to pray with you, we want to pray for you this morning, but just lift your hands one more time. We want to bless you out. Father in heaven, I thank you for these. You've blessed them coming in. Now bless them as they go out. Bless them in the city. Bless them at home. And may your countenance shine upon them. Lord, encourage them and strengthen them in all that they do. May sickness and disease not come near them nor neither dwelling place. I'm also asking Jesus that you provide for them. Open up the heavens. You said give and it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. Meet all of their needs according to your riches and glory. Guide and direct them. Encourage and strengthen them. Lord, minister to them. Father, I'm asking that you would also encourage their family. May the blessing of the Father rest upon them. May they know you and walk with you. And that all that they do, Lord, bring you glory and honor. Now as you go with them, Holy Spirit, walk with them, guide and direct them as you dwell under your anointing and your blessing. Now in Jesus' name, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Give him praise one more time. Amen. Amen.